All right, everyone, let's get the show started. Welcome to our DevOps office hours. It's February 24th, 2021. My name is Eric Osterman, and I'll be leading the conversation. I'm the founder and CEO of Cloud Posse. We're a DevOps accelerator, and that means that we help companies own their infrastructure in record time by building it together with your team while showing them the ropes. If that sounds interesting, head over to cloudposse.com slash quiz to get started. For those of you new to the call, the format is very informal. My goal is to get your questions answered. So feel free to unmute yourself at any time if you want to jump in and participate. If you're tuning in from our podcast or YouTube channel, you can register for these live and interactive sessions by going to cloudposse.com slash office hours. Again, that's cloudposse.com slash office hours. We host these calls every week. We'll automatically post a video recording of this session to our YouTube channel, as well as follow up with an email that you can share with your team. So with that said, let's kick it off. Some cool announcements today. Uh, one is... Uh, Mitchell Hashimoto tweeted that a, um, a PR that implements the first prototype for native uh, HashiCorp testing uh, was merged. And this is available in uh, today, apparently, Terraform 0.15, but 0.15 is still alpha. So, of course, you're going to uh, have to uh, brave the world and uh, use the alpha. So, as part of this, there's an example of uh, how it's implemented and some documentation on it and considerations that they had when they wrote it. And for some reason, my formatting on GitHub is all wonky and I can't show it. So uh, it, it would be powered by a new Terraform uh, subcommand of tests. So you'd run Terraform test, and then you'd define uh, the tests in HCL uh, for how to uh, invoke it. I haven't uh, obviously had a chance to play with it much yet. Uh, they do talk about some of the other considerations that they looked at when uh, designing this, uh, such as TerraTest. Um, uh, apparently, Mart had been working on something uh, in the form of a provider uh, to prototype some testing uh, over a year ago, almost, I think, at this point. Uh, and now uh, this prototype has made its way into the core. Um, you would uh, put your tests uh, into a test folder. You can have uh, collections of tests and run it. Has anybody uh, taken a look at this yet? Looks like it's uh, based on a new resource type, uh, very similar to the provider that uh, apparently Mart was working on. So you have a, an assertion you can make uh, that evaluates uh, the outcome of running some Terraform module. Now, this is a far cry from what you get with something like TerraTest. And I think this is a step in the right direction. I think it'll help uh, provide a greater baseline of testing uh, for Terraform modules. But doing complex things like uh, waiting for EKS nodes uh, to join the cluster and validating that those nodes are uh, ready, I have no idea how you'd go about implementing that given this very limited um, way to express the test, just with assertions on it. Any thoughts on Terraform testing? Is this like? static testing or dynamic? Uh, I think it, I, well, I, I don't know actually what that means in this context. Static would be, it's only testing the, the code. Uh, like the, No, no, this is dynamic testing. It's actually it, it, it executing it. So I've run it. Terraform apply yeah. and then I run Terraform test and it looks at what's actually up in AWS or whatever. That's my understanding. Yes. Okay. That's how it works. Yeah. Um, the uh, Lauren Gordon, uh, regular in Sweet Ops, I saw he posted some uh, comment here. Uh, sounded like a limitation, a little bit. One thing I've run into, uh, one one thing I've run into is tests of modules that use counter for each, 
and issues uh, where the test config generates resources passed to those expressions. Is there a way to index, is there a way the index or label cannot be determined until apply? My workaround has been to support a prereq config. Uh, I don't know, uh, enough about that. Lauren, are you on the call by any chance? So the, the next announcement uh, was also posted in SweetOps. I was pretty excited about. Um, it used to be that you could define globals very easily in the TFR files. And they decided that, uh, and those globals that you define, for example, in the TFR files, you didn't have to have had a variable defined explicitly in your uh, HCL code. In Terraform 0.12, I think, or 13, they changed that to a deprecation notice um, and that you had to explicitly define the variable, which on the one side is kind of nice. I mean, you don't want a bunch of variables necessarily in the TFR files uh, that kind of communicate that you intend to do one thing and then the module does nothing with them and it has no impact. On the other hand, there are a lot of cases where it's convenient to copy in some globals and you'll have like, what is our default region? Not everything needs to consume the region, uh, but it's nice to be able to define it. Uh, and we've run into this with some of the recent work we've done with terraforming um, using like space lift and terraform cloud that when we um, specify some global setting that isn't consumed by the module, then we get the warning. So then we end up designing, uh, defining this no op variable just to get rid of the warning. And that's not much better. So, uh, this is going away in the 0 0.15. It's no longer going to be deprecated. So I'm excited about it. Anybody have any feedback on that? The only thing I'll say is um, having developed probably uh, over 100 modules maybe in my Terraform career now that are published out there, um, that the, the inverse of that would be really useful to be able to run a command that tells me about variables I've declared that are not used yeah. uh, anywhere in Terraform. <laughs> like, because I've, I've done it like in an iteration of a module and then didn't remember to remove some, some variable that I wasn't yeah. using anymore. So I've, I've kicked around the idea of writing, uh, writing a little utility to, to actually figure that out for, you know, at See, some I, point. I think uh, TF Lint, does that i think tf lint will tell you if you're um uh, if there's a variable variable that's unused but don't quote yeah me. i didn't have good success with getting it to work with uh, especially with like complex modules that do okay. like uh interpolations and a yeah, bunch of like other be. things like that it doesn't figure it out so um, i was thinking about running something that just uses the actual hcl parser parses the tree and then like looks through to see if any of that variable is used anywhere once it's been parsed. But TF Lint doesn't use the HCL parser. I, it does. I'm just saying, okay. like you know, I was thinking about just writing a small, like yeah. purpose-built thing. But maybe I should just fix the TF Lint one instead and, <laughs> and contribute that. That, that might yeah. be a good point. I think that would be a good contribution rather than yet one more TF. Yeah, we got TF Sec, yeah. TF Lint, TF M, TF. True. <laughs> Docs. <laughs> but hey, lots of small purpose built utilities. That's what Unix is built on, right? Linux is built on. All right. Do, do one thing well. Do one thing well. <laughs> In this case, <laughs> verify all your variables are used. Um, Pepe, are you on the call? Yes. Oh, awesome. So I saw your announcement in the Atlantis channel. Uh, yeah. A beta pre release was released for Atlantis that adds uh, the OPA support, Open yes. Policy Agent. That's, right. uh, that's pretty exciting. So there's some basic way to apply OPAs on the Terraform plan output file, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 um, be and the behaviors it supports right now is just allowing or denying it based on that. Is there anything else you can do? For now, yeah, that's 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 what you can do. Um, okay. there, there's going to be added added more features, but uh, but now you can. I mean, now you can ex expand the restrictions of, uh, for example, who could who could actually run certain things depending on the policy you use. You use. Oh. So so that's that cool. that that could expand it to like not only, for example, 
uh, a GitHub user or GitHub team like the the, the PR that uh, is still open that hopefully will get merged soon. Um, but you you can expand it to other systems that may pass the information through Terraform that you can actually catch with the OBA policies. And so I wonder what what does that mean for the allow list PR? Maybe that's no longer really relevant. Uh, well, it depends because um, depends on how you want to use it. I mean, for the allow list PR, it uses a GitHub API, which is cool. Um, is I guess, easier entry than actually learning OPA and regular if you're not ready for that. So um, it depends of how you, you could do that. But I don't know if it's actually, um, I'm not 100% sure if, uh, if that's actually possible just yet with this new release. Yeah. That's why they, we released it as a, as a, as a pre-release so that people can test it and give feedback yeah. and then we can add more features to it. That's the, that's the idea. Yeah, I think that's good with pre-releases and it's distribute then at, with a binary, right? So that anyone, yeah, exactly. So it can yeah. just yeah. Uh, be tested right away. That's cool. Yeah. Anyone using Atlantis excited about the OPA support? Oh, man. I, oh, I was just gonna, I'm not there yet. Okay. <laughs> I was just going to ask uh, what, you know, if we think that there might be future uh, HashiCorp influence over this, since it's sort of directly in competition with Sentinel and one of the main benefits for using, you know, some of their paid products. And given that they sort of own both, even though one's an open source project, but they have great influence over them. <laughs> that was the concern, especially when Luke and, um, you know, was, uh, I wouldn't say Acquihard, at least started working for HashiCorp to put the, the future of Atlantis in jeopardy. And, and for the last couple of years, that jeopardy uh, seemed to not be uh, going so well. Um, now there is a contributor uh, ecosystem around it and uh, multiple people have stepped up to help review pull requests. So maybe it will live on uh, yeah. at least. And fortunately it's not under the HashiCorp umbrella. It is under its own organization called Run I can, I can, I can actually answer that question. Actually uh, it was HashiCorp which allowed the fact that to add more maintainers to Atlantis. Oh, it was. So they are yeah. actually supporting it to be an, an open source a project and they don't want it to die either. So they are actually supporting the fact that we are, uh, you know, uh, maintaining the, 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 the project as maintainers. And um, so it's funny that you, I, I, I thought about that too, when uh, before uh, I was added as a maintainer uh, because I wanted to add those features and uh, I, I wanted to fork Atlantis. But then um, uh, I was surprised to know that actually it was HashiCorp, which we, that basically facilitated this work, uh, and 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 they don't they 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 don't uh, uh, I, I don't know if I could say this, but I would try not to. But basically, the answer is no. There, there's no mm -hmm. reason why we, uh, Atlantic would release a feature that that could conflict with HashiCorp. They they don't see it as a problem. So. So if you have uh, you know uh, code that you a PR that you think that you can add and, and is similar to you know some other uh, uh, product that they offer, it, it doesn't it doesn't matter. Nice. Thanks for the, uh, that context. I'm yeah, surprised I, that those I can't help but be a little bit skeptical because of <laughs> historical, you know, like yeah. you know, Oracle with Hudson or yeah. you know or Java. <laughs> Yeah. 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 I, I mean, my, my, my comment basically was like, I hope that that's true. Uh, what, what you said, Pepe, but you know, uh, it's, it's not a problem and it's not competitive until it is. And until it <laughs> starts to erode, you know, some of their are, they get 10, you know, 10 large customers that say, why would I pay for that feature when it's free in in Atlantis or whatever. And, you know, it starts showing up on their radar or whatever. Hopefully they're not going to be big evil corp, but uh, they are in business to make money. So I don't hold out hopes that at some point that won't happen. Embrace, extend, extinguish. <laughs> <laughs> 
I think it's interesting because it's they're going to be running into lots of competition or they already are in the Terraform automation market. Like Terraform Cloud already has some stiff up and coming competition. So yeah. now they're, you know, if they're giving the thumbs up to a, the, you know, the open source way of, of making that happen as well, then they're adding on to their competition market. So it's going to be, it's, it's such an interesting space. I keep running into it all the time. Um, and it's, yeah. Competition is good though, right? I think at this level, and I personally am less excited, less and less excited about Atlantis as I've seen the commercial offerings come out and just how much more polished they are uh, compared to Atlantis. Then again, I mean, thousands of companies are happy with Atlantis. So, Given the fact that Atlantis has people like Pepe, you know, is like when Oracle decided to mess with Hudson, Jenkins was bored, you know, and who uses Hudson now? Nobody, yeah. you know, everybody uses Jenkins, so. Apparently, I, I saw some controversy about that. Apparently, uh, the way it worked out is that Hudson was technically the fork, <laughs> was their uh, position. Uh, I think that's how it worked, something like that. A uh, couple other things that uh, stood out to me in, in the notes of the alpha releases for Terraform 0.15. Uh, there's one thing that totally uh, escaped me. I think it might even be available in before 0 0.15, um, if not Ter Terraform 0 0.14, is the ability to pass the chdir argument. I think this is a uh, relatively elegant uh, implementation for a problem that we ran into a lot, uh, was not every subcommand of Terraform allowed you to run it from another directory other than the current working directory of the Terraform state. And now with the chdir, uh, it allows you to run Terraform and have it apply the files in any uh, given working directory. Or you know, pass it to init, pass it to plan, pass it to apply, pass it to output, pass it to show, you name it, it works. Uh, the other stuff is, so while I think uh, these- Actually, can I ask a question about that? Yeah, go ahead. So can you just clarify how was that different from um, first changing to that directory and then running the command there? I don't understand. Oh, it's identical to that, except for the, the pattern you described requires some bash script or make file to do that. And uh, this is now embedded into the command for a one-liner. OK, thanks. Yeah. Uh, we ran into this problem because we, we were using it um, Terraform supports some, the ability to, we're, so we're not using this pattern anymore, largely because Terraform broke it in 0 0.13. Um, but Terraform supports a number of variables that begin with uh, TF, yeah, you have the TF var, and then you also have like TF cli, yeah, so if, if you wanted to set some backend, if you wanted to set some defaults when you call Terraform, like if you wanted to set the default uh, bucket, you know, like buckets, uh, like state backends in Terraform don't support interpolation, but that you can specify them on the command line, but specifying it on the command line all the time would be tedious. So you can set them as environment variables. So for example, if you wanted to set the, the bucket name dynamically, you could set this environment variable tfcliargs init equals, and then the value. So this here would always set the backend to example bucket. I think that second dash there is actually a typo. I think I meant, no, actually that's right. <laughs> No, so this is setting uh, the TFCLI backend configuration for the bucket equal to example. A uh, little bit of esoteric Terraform CLI knowledge there. Um, I'm just going to add another comment. Um, one reason I'm happy to see this is we were using a paradigm where we have one repository and uh, different environments for the application as subdirectories in that repository. So in our CI, we would have to CD into the environment directory to do all of our Terraform stuff. Now we could just 
you know, have the commands at the top level without, like you were saying, have to put some bash commands to CD into a directory and then do everything. And if you want to, you know, proceed to the next environment, CD up and CD down again, yeah. you can just do it all at the top. Yeah, that's a good point. I think it's moving from this, like, uh, stop thinking about Terraform as a command you run strictly on your local workspace and think about it as a tool that you use for continuous delivery uh, of infrastructure. And then you just want to, you want to run a command and have it apply a configuration and uh, you shouldn't have to do console type activity like CD uh, somewhere. All right, uh, that was that. Uh, other announcements. Um, yeah, we have set up our Cloud Posse GitHub sponsors uh, page. So if you go to github.com slash sponsor, sponsors Cloud Posse, you can sponsor us for as little as a dollar a month. Uh, show your support. Uh, you know, it helps out, pays for you know, our GitHub licenses and um, uh, renovate bot licenses and all that stuff like that. Also, uh, the recording for today will be posted to our YouTube channel. So if you go to youtube.com slash C slash cloud posse, you will be able to uh, catch up on this recording and past recordings as well. Cool. Well, let's uh, jump into some talking points. Um, uh, looks like I screwed up here. Evan, I saw, uh, your questions, uh, in the office hours channel. I thought we'd get to those first. Uh, so one of your questions was, is there a way of injecting a template into a Helm chart with Helm file? And I'll be honest, I haven't checked, uh, what's happened in the past six months or so with Helm file. But the idea of Helm file is really just as a declarative way to call Helm. And it's not uh, supposed to like be used for monkey patching Helm charts. Uh, that's a different use case. And I don't think that's what it does. Uh, maybe, but you know, the, the Helm file is a Swiss army knife of radical proportion. And maybe something like that has made its way in eventually. Um, there is a similar solution but not the solution you're asking for what we like to do is like there's a helm chart we want to use it but it's missing a complex way of defining ingress rules for example um, many charts out there allow us to disable the ingress so we we deploy that chart we disable the ingress and then we use the kubernetes uh the um kubernetes uh, raw chart for Helm. Okay. Now, I'm not sure if the new home has been announced since, uh, you know, official charts has been deprecated, but this pattern is used everywhere. It's, I really love it because it allows you to use a consistent set of tooling like Helm. Um, you can use the, you know, one of the thousand of Helm charts out there, but you can also just embed your own raw resources just as values. Uh, and when you're using Helm file, that's a great pattern because if you go to like Cloud Posse Helm files and you search here for like raw, we'll find an example of using the raw chart. Uh, what's one I want to use maybe? We have a lot of them. Okay. All right, well, let's look at the Datadog one here. So here we are deploying uh, the uh, the AWS secret, which is a custom resource definition, uh, a CRD, uh, using then a raw resource. And obviously we wouldn't expect the chart maintainer to add support for some esoteric CRD. So we can just deploy that CRD though with Helm file passing the chart uh, Kubernetes incubator raw and putting the inline YAML for that here. And it gets deployed as a Helm release using the raw chart, passing this as the values. And then we configure Datadog, for example, to look for that secret. Uh, I, I'm guessing it may, oh yeah, uh, API existing secret. So then we point it to the existing secret name here 
And now we've made the Datadog Helm chart automatically get its secrets from SSM, even though the chart had no idea how to talk to SSM. It's pretty slick. Cool. I was uh, really, the two questions were kind of interrelated. Um, I was asking about the customize portion because the reason I was hoping to inject rather than use a separate chart was because I was hoping to have the same values from, uh, you know, labels and all, all the mm -hmm. data. That's a good, yeah, I see what you're saying there based on that use case. Certainly uh, not a deal breaker, but uh, yeah. it just seems yeah. like it would have been a nice. Well, I, 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 I confess I haven't used customize with Helm file. Yeah. Um, I just, I just wanted to jump into this. One of the things I'm looking for, so I forgot his name, um, the, the Japanese contributor. Yeah, yeah, Yusuke or uh, Mumoshu. Yeah, Yusuke. So Yusuke um, has this complete customized syntax that could be used inside of the Helm file now. Oh, wow. And But there's no documentation on it. <laughs> and, and so if we could get some examples together, it'd be great. Like what I was doing is I was using that hook to just run customize outside of it and create an uh, app uh, okay. help, like Helm chart. But you don't need to do that anymore. You can actually support customize inside your Helm file. That's cool. And, but it's just, um, I don't know how to use it. So I don't know if we could get some examples and stuff. It sounds like, uh, yeah, so we have no, also cloud, you know, cloud posse and sweet ops has no official affiliation with it, uh, other yeah. than being users, but, uh, that's interesting. And I can explain why customize is going to become like extremely important. Um, in the near future. Is it this basically an ex the example you want to see how to uh, use it? Much. Yeah, that might. Yeah, that might be some of the syntax. Actually, that might be it. Um, so I'll, so I'll share it in the office hours channel. Thanks. Um, so the one thing is why customize is going to become really important is because like right now these days, as people know, everyone and their brothers doing uh, operators. Yeah. It's like operators, 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 and operators don't have like the best support like helm charts and they introduce their own api sometimes mimic yeah. kubernetes api redundantly unnecessarily and so um it gets like a nightmare to kind of manage the dependency chain on operators and a lot of them don't support helm charts to install the crd or the operator yeah. and so customize is sometimes your only way to go to use where a current project may only support operators from that point on, and, and you're just stuck with custom, customize. I think it helps in the interaction with operators. Yeah, I like that. Uh, I like that. Uh, that's actually expanding kind of my thinking right now. Uh, I didn't have that. I didn't have this in my toolbox uh, for how to think about Helm uh, with customize. Um, so one of the things I think is a good small example is like, we use a lot of projects, we use tracing. So Jaeger is um, popular for tracing. And so they have kind of an operator to bootstrap some of that and get that all installed. And that's kind of a customized path to do all that stuff. Cool. Can I do some shameless self-promotion? Yes, yeah. go for it, Andrew. I wrote a tool to convert CRDs to, or like any, any Kubernetes YAML to a format that you can just Dump into the uh, the the incubator raw chart. Oh, I had this, cool. I had I this exact that. problem. Yeah. Yeah. I had this exact problem where I had a massive CRD that I needed to do, and I was like, "Well, the incubator raw chart is the way I do this kind of stuff," you know. So I I wrote this little tool that just you run the 10,000 lines or whatever it is of Kubernetes YAML through this little thing. And it hands yeah. you a values file, a values.yaml that you, you can use for the incubator raw chart. Yeah, okay. that's cool. I, and just, just to make, uh, uh, eliminate any confusion, uh, I think that that is complementary to what uh, Joaquin is talking about with regards to using customized. Cause, like, so the raw chart is not for monkey patching. It's more like for tacking on stuff. And the customized stuff is like from monkey patching uh, the, the chart or the resources. 
Do you want? You can go ahead and share that uh, little tool you wrote, Andrew, in the uh, office hours. In case uh, that's also, off topic, but if you guys ever had um, any material like how to manage operators and whatnot, um, <laughs> I had an uh, experience with Prometheus. So which went from stable to their own managed chart, and they changed the CRD and added all these hooks that I never knew about in Kubernetes. Yeah. And it was a freaking nightmare to uh, make it work. Um, in yeah. I I have the same bad taste in my mouth. Uh, I so conceptually, absolutely love operators. Operators are what makes Kubernetes so beautiful. It's what uh, it allows you to treat it as a framework for automation in uh, cloud environments. But the day two operations of the operator uh, and keeping those up to date are really scary. Uh, most recently, you know, we've been bit by things like an Istio and those upgrade paths have suck. As it relates to Prometheus and Prometheus Operator and all that stuff, man, that's been a nightmare for us. We've gone through probably eight major releases of Prometheus and Prometheus Operator and Prometheus Charts. So much so that every single time Cloud Posse has done a rollout of Prometheus for a customer, we've never once been able to reuse what we did for the previous customer, because the community has, the chart has either moved from one maintainer to another, to an operator, uh, to, to being deprecated, to being redone. It's just, yeah. So this is the price we pay for using open source. You need an open source especially. I also, uh, one of our customers brought up um, Istio just released um, a new version. I think it's, was it 1.9? Yeah, I think it's Istio 1. Dot. Yeah, 1.9 was just released two weeks ago. And the emphasis with this release is improving day two operations. And I just loved it. I thought, ah, okay. So it's not just that we are, we don't know what we're doing. Actually, everybody was having the same problem. So I felt vindicated uh, seeing this announcement. Can you link that in the chat, Eric? Yeah. I want to see what they link out to there for day two operations. Yeah, and and I'm not saying this fixes it actually, but this was at least just you know the first thing to uh, how was the expression like. Uh, get, the first way, the you know, in negotiation, the first way to get somebody to help you see your point is you, you got to em em empathize with them and their position before uh, explaining how you're right. So I felt their empathy in that. All right, office hours. There we go. So I didn't have any more prepared que questions today. Uh, let's see in the office hours channel if anything else was uh, posted there. I'd like to get to. One question, just while you folks are talking about this raw chart, um, you know, pattern that you've used, uh, I just recently, I didn't know about the raw chart. That's really interesting to know about, but um, I just recently uh, wrapped uh, a provider's chart. Like I wrapped the Argo CD chart um, with a parent chart. So it's a sub chart and it installs all the dependencies. And then I just disabled the, 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 particular manifests resources that I, that I didn't need. And then, you know, or, or yeah. needed to override and then use that in my, uh, you know, provided the replacements in my parent chart, it's doing the same thing, obviously, yeah. but, it, you know, is there a benefit over one or the other? I guess the, the benefit is that, you know, maybe it's less complex if you're going the raw chart pattern, but it's like somewhat similar, it sounds like. Well, so there's a few more things. So if you are going down that route, uh, and it's not, it, that was kind of like the original way it was intended with these umbrella charts, right? And umbrella charts could have dependencies and actually the ability to uh, manage the, the values for dependencies came much later on in uh, Helm 2, uh, depending on when you got started. Anyways, it's been around forever now, so it's, it's a moot point. The, you're, so you're on the hook, first of all, for managing one more chart. Um, and that can get tedious when you want to string a lot of things together. You can, it's also tedious if like the way I, a, mat, you know, a good way to think about it is a little bit like that chart 
now becomes like your Terraform root module. And uh, that chart, and that root module has these uh, child modules. In this case, it's a Helm chart. It's an umbrella chart with uh, subcharts. And in Terraform, how easy is it if you decided that, well, we actually don't want to couple the Redis database with my microservice because now that Redis database is shared with three other services and this, this, this service shouldn't be the owner of the, my, of the Redis uh, service. That's a real pain in the butt now if you're deploying that stateful service in your umbrella chart and you want it to have a life cycle that's decoupled from your chart. With Helm file, there's no, it's a loose coupling uh, and you achieve the same outcome. I got you. Yeah, I, I get what you're getting at there. Uh, makes sense. Yeah, I wish I was using Helm file. I, yeah, didn't get the chance to do that for well, the okay. and, Kubernetes and, and, cluster and, that I managed. So, so you know, we, we're still big, big time users of Helm file and I like Helm file. Um, we, we publish all our Helm files here. I, I feel like some of the benefits of Helm file are, are being commoditized as support for Helm has really improved in Kubernetes, as well as alternative ways for controlling the delivery of Helm releases has also changed with the advent of like Argo CD. Um, so I feel like Helm file is made redundant if you are using Argo CD as well. So Helm file is really just a, one of the choices for how to do continuous delivery of, uh, Helm and Kubernetes resources. Yeah. And I, I agree with you. I, I think that I haven't needed that much, um, in terms of the, the Helm file regard, but the one thing I, I did recently run into that, that bugged me a lot was that templating um, values uh, or, you know, or providing values from like environment variables um, would be really nice, but it's like not, not yeah. a thing that's, that's natively supported in Helm. So I think Helm file still has somewhat of a place, but yeah, Argo solves some of it too. Yeah. Um, like at my, at my company, we um, have a distributed database. And so our recommended platform because of stateful sets is a uh, Corsa Kubernetes. And uh, so sometimes it gets really hard to kind of integrate between like, say tracing or monitoring or different aspects LOM does with our product. And so I've been using Helm files as a way to communicate to customers how to kind of slap it all together and values that are go yeah. say between multiple charts that, you know, when you change one chart, affect another chart, et cetera. Um, and so it's worked out beautifully. And I just yeah. start looking at it publicly and stuff so people can consume it. Andrew Roth, I know, has done a lot um, at uh, SAIC, and it's uh, they they provide like Helm files as a service uh, to to divisions to rapidly bring up like GitLab following best exactly. Yeah. I mean, we want we want Helm we want to have root modules for Kubernetes deployments, just like we have root modules for two, for Terraform. If if some team wants to deploy their own GitLab, I want to hand them the easiest way to do it possible while still keeping guardrails in place. So what we do is we say, you know, here's the GitLab Helm file, do whatever you want, whatever it lets you do, we're cool with, you know? And so we structure the Helm file such that, you know, it, it requires by default SAML integration, you know, for SSO. And you can turn that off if you want to just deploy it to kind or something, but like by default, it's production ready. Nice. And Helm file also supports remote Helm files, just like Terraform supports remote modules. So that's the other cool thing. So you can really create a centralized service catalog and just reference them remotely by version. Another thing I do too, I, I don't know if people do this, is um, because some of the variables you use environment variables, I have the env.sh. And so um, what I do is I have Terraform modules if they need to access some cloud specific stuff like an S3 bucket or whatever it is, IMA profile. Um, I'll use the uh, Terraform to template out the ENV SHs. And then I'll use dir env to source it. And then depending on the directory or structure they'll, they're in, it'll source the right kube config, AWS profile, and the ENV SH. Mm. 
Yeah, that, that's the kind of Swiss Army uh, stuff you can do. There's an escape hatch for everything if you use Helm file. Yeah, there is one thing that I was wondering, if I can. Yeah, go ahead, Matteo. Uh, into, you know, I was fighting quite recently with a sub chart inside the Helm. And, you know, the difference that I've noticed that, I don't know if it's my lack of knowledge, but, you know, in Terraform, you can define a local variable and then you can catch that uh, value and use it into a, a model. Yeah. So you can basically, uh, I don't know, for example, if you want to set exactly the same tag everywhere, even into the model, you can use a local, for example, and use the local var value for, for that. Instead in, uh, in Helm, I don't know if it is possible, but I was using, uh, there is a, a sub chart for Spark that is allowing you, I mean, basically the subchart is on its own, it is starting other pods and those pods has a namespace that is defined by a variable into the subchart. So that namespace is not consistent and you cannot, you know, set a variable to make it consistent with the above mm -hmm. charts, if, if that, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, this sounds like why you might want to use the customize integration with uh, Helm files so you can enforce uh, a consistency there. Yeah. In the vast majority of cases, you are you are able to set values of subcharts in the values of the top level. And it's an example I would use is like if you're going to deploy Ghost, you know, which is like a blogging platform. Ghost has a subchart of Postgres for a database. If in your values.yaml for Ghost, if you say Postgres dot resources dot you know or whatever, it's going to set values for that Postgres chart that it that it has as a subchart. Yeah, but it's hard to go the other way, right? Get values from the subchart into the parent. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I would make the argue that you should never go the other way. Well, there's often helpers defined in the child project that are quite useful in making sure that uh, the metadata from different charts line up are the different uh, yeah. charts. I think you I can do that. You can yeah. use helpers from the subchart. Um, sure. Yeah, I've done that. Um, but yeah, you can't use the values it sets in its own default values.yaml. Sure. Um, yeah. To your point, Andrew, I think when you're in control of the chart ecosystem, you can kind of uh, avoid that. Uh, but if you're using a lot of third-party charts, it can be uh, like service names and stuff might not be that as deterministic as we'd like them to. And then it gets really hard for this service to discover this other services um, yeah. hosting. I mean, the what I've what I started doing months ago and and am continuing to do it because it's just it makes my life so much easier is and like if if like GitLab depends on a, a again a Postgres database. GitLab the GitLab chart can deploy its own Postgres database and it's that's a tight coupling. I've stopped doing that. I just say, you know, I, I tell GitLab to disable the Postgres database in my exact same health file. I have another release for a Postgres database. Okay. So let's, be, so let's be fair, man, that GitLab chart is like the fattest chart I've ever seen in my whole life. Oh my God, it's terrible. I've never seen so many like sub charts in my whole life. How would anyone think that's a declarative way of doing anything? It's insane. <laughs> it's, oh, it's so, terrible. It's terrible. I've never seen such a big chart ever. So well, like, so Ghost is another, you know, I used Ghost earlier. Ghost is smaller, much smaller, but it has, it will deploy its own Postgres database if you tell it to. And I just stopped telling it to ever do that. And I just, in my Helm file, I have another release right next to the ghost release above it, right? So it happens first to deploy Postgres with a loose coupling there. If you want to see a fun complex chart, check out the Spinnaker one. I imagine that's fun too. When the spin when the Spinnaker has been easy, even even before Kubernetes it has been difficult. So yeah. Yeah, this is kind of some of the realization I've had uh, about you know two years ago uh, 
when the maturity of so many of these charts were coming out, we got so excited. Look, we can deploy everything we want in our own cluster and we don't have to pay all these SaaS services. We deployed Sentry and uh, we deployed uh, uh, Keycloak and Gatekeeper and all these other things, uh, and the Prometheus, Grafana. And it's really easy from a, relatively speaking, it's pretty easy from the day one <laughs> getting it deployed. And then suddenly you're on the hook for like, oh wait, why is Sentry not capturing any of the errors? And then you got to figure that out. Oh, Sentry made a major update and the architecture has changed 180 degrees between uh, you know two versions. Now that's your responsibility. And that's how I feel with some of these things. Like, yeah, you can go deploy GitLab very successfully. Um, tell, you know, get back to me in one year after running it and, and let me know how many times you upgraded it and it went well. I noticed you mentioned Keycloak there and we've had that same, you know, discussion, but it's like, what are you going to do? You're going to run Okta and make them charge you $20 per month per user just for SSO. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. There's trade-offs, <laughs> but uh, chances are Okta's negotiable. Chances are you're not negotiable about your salary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's oh, an dude, the color of problem. money is real. Yeah. AWS SSO works now. Yeah. <laughs> Did you finish that module, Matt? Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, I'm gonna check that out. I'm looking forward to that one. Yeah, and I, I have to upstream a component um, that that makes it all work, like actually work, work. But um, that should be coming shortly. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Hey, about Keycloak SSO and stuff, has any of you ever deployed Boundary and tried it out successfully? It's too no. complicated. <laughs> right? I had exactly the same feeling. It's too fucking complicated to get started. Yeah. Sorry for the <laughs> This is just, I just got Matt, it's so yeah. funny. Matt, Matt, one, Matt suggested after last week, we got to <laughs> do a you know, zero trust beyond corp office hour session where we just get it out of us. Every single week, it just like comes up. Uh, I guess it's because we're, we're all touching it in some way and bothered by it in some way every week. But yeah, well, it's, it makes sense because it's like, who wants to run a VPN anymore? I, yeah. I, right. I really don't. And, and I think that, you know, um, Muhammad has brought up, like he really likes AWS VPN. I, I don't like it. Like I, I, I think that like even the managed service VPN solutions are still a huge pain. And I want something that allows access for the team I'm building it to be very like, you know, easy for them, SSO based but then also be, you know, a SaaS product. So there's all these options out there and they're just, they have tons of quirks Terrible. and tons of pain and it's, it's fun. I, I don't it's want any space to too. challenges upgrading it. I want it easily deployed with just a Helm chart. Yeah. I mean, even the Terraform stuff, they have a Terraform that works on AWS, but even that is like, it deploys everything for you. It kind of works, but it's still super difficult to use. Mm. Like if you look at it, it runs more EC2 instances than my Kubernetes clusters. It's like eight, uh, eight EC2 instances to get started. And I'm like, why? Why? Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> they have this whole multi-cluster or like high availability solution for their like open source offering. And it seems so heavy um, for what it is. And I think that it'll be interesting from a cloud offering perspective, like when they start offering it properly as a, um, you know, SaaS product, and you just need to, you know, host the um, gateway, whatever their version of a gateway is, then it'll be pretty attractive. Um, but I don't know how far along they are in that. And I still think it's got a year before I would even consider it. Oh, uh, Oliver, I just saw your question here. What is the best place to propose a change to the HCL2 language? So to make enabling and disabling a resource a first class uh, you know, citizen in the language, e.g. a Boolean called enabled or not, so we don't have to use the you know, Cloud Posse Terraform null label. No, you have to keep using the Cloud Posse Terraform null label for that. And counts. Sorry. <laughs> HashiCorp uh, Hashi yeah. slash HCL2. Yeah. Well, I think That's it would be the, a Terraform change because it wouldn't be, yeah. or maybe it would be implemented at HCL. Yeah. So, so yeah. So yeah. Joking aside, uh, I think yeah. The, the the repo they're talking about is HashiCorp slash HCL two. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yep. That's oh, it. this one was archived though, and now it's been. Oh named. right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I forgot they renamed it. Uh, I think it's just called HCL now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So this is where you would open your feature request for that, Oliver. I'll share it. Okay. Cool. Thanks, guys. Question. Only 115 issues. Like comparatively, that's not too bad, I guess. <laughs> That's because they that's because they changed it from the HCL two to HCL and only migrated open issues at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so HCL two had thousands at the point, uh, and I knew that one right off the top of my head because I was thousands the open. Author. I was yeah at one point I was the author wow. of many of them saying, <laughs> "Can you fix this? Can you fix this? Can you fix this?" So they they to their credit they fixed a lot of stuff. So I was happy. Well, that's good. You try to get like Red Hat to do something and they're like, where's my million dollars? And uh, Andrew, you saw, I saw your question in the uh, Zoom chat here. What, what it's uh, the helm file.d folder. Uh, Pierre answers that, yeah, this is just how you can load all the charts in there in lexicographical order or all the helm files in lexicographical order. So it's just a fast So the way I've done that is use the 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 helm files section it's like i'll have a main helm file and then i'll have some sub helm files yeah is, so this, is there like a, is an advantage like, one way or the other well it's kind of like the evolution of the tool uh, so when we when cloud posse started using helm file there wasn't the ability to do the other thing and you couldn't even do helm file.d and we wanted some way just to load lots of helm files and process them and this was the fastest imp way to implement it at the time. And it, the, the tool has evolved since then. So we don't use Helm file.d anymore, actually. And we do more like what you have. Got it. Yeah. Sorry, quick one about the disabling and enabling stuff uh, on your models. Yeah. Uh, apparently, when I disable a model, Terraform still sees that as existent. So if I rely on a depends on to create or not a, another resource that is referring the model, anyway, the second resource is created. Am I doing anything wrong or? Sounds like you're not passing the same context uh, file or like, so if you pass the context to both of those modules, they'll both get the in, uh, enabled false set to them. So then I'm they'll not. both be disabled by default. I'm not, you're right. <laughs> okay, so that's the key. And this is the beauty is that when you're using the null label with the context TF pattern, we've talked a lot about, uh, that's passing that context to every single module you have. So when you disable it in one place, everything is just automatically disabled everywhere. Okay, cool, thank you. All right. Uh, well, we are almost out of time here. We got about five more minutes. Uh, any last uh, questions, thoughts, announcements? There was a CDK question in the Office Hours channel. A CDK in the Office Hours. Let me uh, pull that up. Thanks, Andy. Let's see here. Yeah, above uh, that one. Above that one? Yeah. I think it was close to starting time. Oh, I totally missed that then. There you go. Okay. Uh, Managed Chaos asked a uh, question. AWS CDK, what are your thoughts, especially if you've used any pattern-based code like the CDK patterns? Uh, background, I recently tried to use CDK for a container project using some pattern-based code and found it difficult to wedge the code into a mold that fit my application. Uh, ports to the con uh, container and load balancer along with other health checks. So I'm, uh, I'm not actually familiar with the CDK patterns. Let's take a look at that. Anybody- Isn't it just that? AWS's version of like Pulumi with imperative infrastructure as code? Yeah, I've, I've actually done some, some CDK development. Um, yeah, so it's basically that you can use, you can use any of your favorite languages or whatever. Now they have Go and TypeScript and Python or Go is I still think still uh, experimental now, but basically they have a um, they have a construct that allows you to write write top level 
constraint or top level resources basically um, in those languages. And then they can either they can either generate cloud formation or if you use CDK for Terraform, they can actually generate Terraform um, under the hood and then you apply them using the CDK CLI. Well, that's CDK uh, a, in a nutshell, but what is CDK yeah. patterns? Yeah, so the, the patterns is like is um, a bunch of serverless based um, templates to um, to deploy serverless applications on directly on CDK. So mm -hmm. they give you a bunch of like the, the common things that you would want to do. So they, they've pulled together a bunch of common scenarios and implemented them in CDK as, um, and I think Andy was you who just mentioned it was, it's very similar to um, the Pulumi crosswalk for AWS where they've taken a bunch of low level Pulumi um, constructs and built them up to be common scenarios that you've normally deployed, you know, that you would normally deploy. So this is kind of like their module uh, level things. Like, um, yeah, it's like a Terraform module. Yeah, it's a yeah, module this library. Is, yeah, this right? is Michael. I, I've asked the questions and really like kind of the approach that, that I came from, I was looking at uh, deploying a, a container-based application and I started to look at all the Terraform that I would have to write. And I know that Terraform, you know, know it and love it, but it's a lot of code, right? <laughs> so I was like, well, let me look at the CDK thing. And I looked at an example and it was maybe, I don't know how many lines of code, but say it's like a, a page worth of code compared to say like 10 pages of Terraform that I have to write. So I was like, okay, let me give it a shot. And they have this, um, exactly what I was trying to build. It's a um, load balanced uh, ECS service. And I was like, that's exactly what I wanna do. And there's a pattern for it. And you kind of fill out you know, some defaults. And there's, there are more than the defaults, more options than the defaults. But after I tried to do it, you know, I finally got it up and running, but all the defaults were, were bad. And like the documentation was, was hard to interpret to get it to do what I wanted to do with my application, which was running on port 3000. The defaults were on port 80. And even when I got it to connect to my application on port 3000, the health checks were still looking at some different, like I think port 80. And I couldn't find an option that said, hey, don't do the health checks over here on port 80, do it on you know this port that I configure it. So I was just wondering if anybody had run into, you know, it doesn't have to be ECS or containers, but something similar where you're using one of these patterns and you, you kind of have to tweak it a bit to, to get it to work. My opinion, at least on this, is how, also how we advise customers on doing it, is that customers should develop their own patterns for doing things mm -hmm. or like a module, which is opinionated. Because if you try and make everything configurable, at some point you walk yourself back to square one where there's just too much... Uh, too much configuration. And this is where I think it's better pick a pattern than make your apps conform to the pattern. Don't make the pattern conform to your apps. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, enough said. Yeah. And let's see. So there were some other uh, questions that came in here. I saw them. So what are the pros and cons of using Kubernetes over AWS ECS? What are the differences when managing uh, Kubernetes with or without Helm charts? I, you know, this is, I, I love the question, David. Uh, I, I think we're basically out of time for today. So I'm going to pin this for next week. And we will uh, make that the first uh, question that we ask or answer uh, next week. Um, and I'll pin it's this. It's a big question. Here. It is a big question. <laughs> it, it's not worthy for me. I to think it has a fairly teach. simple answer. That's very that that can be very nuanced, but yeah, I think it's a good conversation purely from the perspective of I feel like there's a line for everyone, and where that line is uh, depends on you know how you think about it. Uh, so I would like to hear the con like yeah have we'll people from this community discuss. So bring your boxing gloves next week. Uh, the lines will be drawn. And uh, you get to join which side of that the, line. The, Emacs the is answer, better than Vim. Spaces are better than tabs. <laughs> Wait, the answer isn't it's the cool new thing and it looks better on your resume. I thought that was the only reason. <laughs> <laughs> Neither. All right. Well, we are basically out of time for today. So before uh, we open up a new can of worms, let's just end it there. 
Thank you, everyone, uh, for your participation today. We had another great office hours session. We'll uh, see you all next week, same time, same place. Uh, as you all know, you can always book a time with uh, us at Cloud Posse by heading over to cloudposse.com slash quiz. And uh, you'll be able to, after filling out some uh, quick questions, you'll be able to uh, find out if there's some way we can help you out. Uh, do check out some of our other resources. You can always listen to our office hours via our podcast by going to podcast.cloudposse.com or subscribing it to however you listen to podcasts. All right. Have a great rest of your week. Talk to you soon. Cheers, guys.